Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So for Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and Hypermobility Spectrum Disorder Awareness Month, we're going to be talking about classical EDS, going through the diagnosis, the symptoms, as well as talking with somebody who actually has classical EDS. I'm really excited because after this video, I'm going to be releasing another one that really gets into like the details of classical EDS, what causes it exactly, and you know, what's wrong with the collagen. It's not for everybody because it's really science-y, but please Please keep a lookout for that. I worked really hard on it and I think that you'll enjoy it. So let's get into this video. Classical EDS is previously known as EDS type 1, sometimes also type 2, and it's the second most common type. It's estimated to affect about 1 in 20,000 people. Its main symptoms are skin hyperextensibility and atrophic scarring, as well as generalized joint hypermobility and a lot of issues with wound healing. People with classical EDS deal with chronic pain, dislocations, as well as all of the other things that really come along with the hypermobile type so they can have systemic manifestations like dysautonomia, POTS, gastroparesis, mast cell activation syndrome, and all of those comorbidities. Classical EDS also has a bit more of an increased risk when it comes to some of the more dangerous issues like aortic root dissection, but it's not dramatically higher than the hypermobile type. Today we're with Kristen who has classical EDS and she's going to share with us some of her experiences and what prompted her to get a diagnosis and genetic testing. So Kristen, do you want to tell us a little about how old you were when you were diagnosed and what you were first diagnosed with? Um, I was 20 when I was first diagnosed. Um, I was diagnosed with hypermobile first until we got the genetic testing back and I had the mutation on the call 5 a one gene that shows that it's classical EDS. Before seeing the geneticist, we thought it was autoimmune. I was diagnosed with lupus. Um, I was actually misdiagnosed with leukemia at first but eventually figured out it was classical EDS and I also have the mutation for mitochondrial disease. Like what was your reaction when you found out? When I found out about the genetic testing, I kind of felt relieved almost. Well, I have proof now, like no one can say like, no, you don't have it. Cause I mean, hypermobile is completely like valid and true and painful. And I mean, like I went a year with it, but I have also had doctors saying like, is that really a true thing? Like, maybe you're just making it up and now have like a piece of paper and say like, no, look at my genes. So, I mean, I guess there's that, but at the same time I was like, wow, it's real. Like I can't, like I'm not making it up. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> If you don't know, hypermobile EDS is the most common type of EDS. In fact, around 90% of people who have EDS have the hypermobile type. But something that's really confusing about it is that it's also the only type without a known genetic cause, meaning that they have yet to find the mutation. And there are so many studies going on trying to find that gene mutation, but with the absence of that known gene mutation, it can make it really hard for hypermobile EDS patients to be fully believed by doctors, which is really such a shame because it's just as real as all of the other types of EDS. Classical EDS almost always requires a genetic diagnosis. However, there's actually some clinical criteria that doctors can use to try to figure out if somebody is kind of like, not at risk for having classical EDS, but to see if they have signs that might indicate they do in fact have the classical type. And if somebody has those signs, it's probably a good idea to do genetic testing. So if you're curious about that clinical criteria, I will put it down below in the description for you. But just again, that is not even close to enough for an actual diagnosis. A big misconception that some people have is that classical EDS is always more severe than the hypermobile type because the hypermobile type is seen as the least dangerous. That's not necessarily true at all. It really just depends on the individual. Um, people with hypermobile type and classical type can have definitely the same level of pain and joint dislocation, systemic issues. The main thing that separates the classical type from the hypermobile type is skin involvement. There tends to be so many more skin issues that come with the classical type, even though the hypermobile type obviously does have skin issues too. So for example, people with classical EDS, if they have some sort of surgery, sometimes that incision 
won't close with stitches. It will kind of rip through the stitches, they have to get stitches again, it rips through, they have to get stitches again. Yeah. <laughs> Typically, I think when people talk about, you know, what's different between the hypermobile type and the classical type, they tend to really bring up skin. There tends to be a lot more skin fragility in classical EDS, so I was wondering if you would share a bit about your experience with that, if you have experience with that. Um, yeah, so I actually just had surgery on Thursday, and the wounds on my stomach are completely open. Like, I have to go back to wound care today to try to get them closed, but I don't heal. Like, the last time I had surgery, it took over three months for my surgical scars to just, like, stay closed. Like, they kept opening. I have mitral valve prolapses which I know can come with hypermobile as well, but um, my aorta is dilated. I guess that's the difference, but again, hypermobile can all have that stuff too. Yeah, totally. Classical EDS is most commonly caused by a COL5A1 or COL5A2 mutation. These types of mutations are inherited in an autosomal dominant manner, which means that somebody in every single generation of your family has to have classical EDS. Unless you happen to be the first person who has a mutation, it's not super common in classical EDS for you to be the first. However, it obviously had to happen somewhere at some point, so it could have been you. Rarely, classical EDS can be caused by a COL1A1 mutation, and that's inherited in an autosomal recessive manner, which means that each of your parents needs to have one copy of the mutated gene, but it does not affect them. But then you get both, and that affects you. That's pretty rare. But anyway, if you want to hear exactly what these mutations mean and what they mean for the collagen, I'm going to be putting down below in the description the video that I'm releasing after this where I actually go into depth about what classical EDS even is. Because you have a rarer type of EDS, have you had any trouble connecting with others who have the same type? I don't know anyone with classical EDS, if that's what you're asking. Um, but I really don't know too many people with EDS. Um, I really haven't found like a huge group. And on that note, I actually just wanted to quickly say to keep a lookout uh, towards the end of the month, I'm going to do something where I help connect people who have rarer types of EDS. I think it can be really hard for people who have any type other than HEDS or HSD to find somebody with the same type. And sometimes that's because there really are so few people, but other times it's just because there are so few people you are not able to connect um, and I would love to help you. I think that there are certain experiences that really only somebody with the same type that you have would fully understand. So get ready for that. I really want to thank Kristen for coming on today and speaking with us about her experience with classical EDS and her diagnostic journey and I really hope that you learned something about classical EDS. Please let me know if you have any questions. All of my sources are linked down below in the description as well as that next video and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.